Haynes and Zimbardo's study of 1973, a study of prisoners and guard in a simulated prison. The hypothesis of the study was, assignment to the condition guard or prisoner will result in a significantly different reaction on behavior measures of interaction, emotional measures of mood and state and pathology, attitudes towards self, as well as other indices of copying and adaptations of the novel situation. Participants. In an initial poll of 75 respondents answering to a newspaper advertisement asking for male volunteers for a psychological study of prison life in return for a payment of $15 per day. Based on a detailed questionnaire, the, most, the 24 most physical and mentally stable, mature and least involved in antisocial behaviors were selected for the study. 22 participants plus two standbys. They were all male college students living in the Stanford area. The participants were randomly allocated to one of the two conditions, the prisoner role or the guard role. In order to observe the resulting pattern of behavior, Payne Banks and Zimbardo built a prison in the basement of the psychology department at Stanford University. Three small cells, six by nine feet, were created, each containing a mattress, sheet, and pillow. A small closet, two by two by seven feet, served as a solitary confinement facility. <sighs> Operation details. Prisoners remain in prison 24 hours a day the for the entire city. Three randomly assigned to each three cells. Guards worked on three-man, eight-hour shifts and went about their normal lives at other times. The prisoners wore loose-fitting muslin smocks with ID numbers front and back no underclothes, rubber sandals, and a cap made from nylon stocking. They each had a light chain and lock around one ankle. They were issued a toothbrush, soap, soap dish, towel, and bed lidding, but no personal belongings were allowed. The guards carry a whistle, a police baton, and wore plain khaki shirts and trousers, and reflected sunglasses, which made eye contact impossible. Prisoners immediately became very passive while guards were very active in giving orders. The most common form of verbal behavior. Verbal exchanges were strikingly impersonal with few references to individual identity. Although it was clear that to all participants, no physical violence would be tolerated, various kinds of more indirect aggression, such as verbal insults, were quite common, especially on the part of the guards. Results. In general, both guards and prisoners showed marked tendency towards increased negative emotions, and their overall outlook became more and more negative. Self-evaluations of both groups also became more disapproving. Overt behavior was generally consistent with the subjective self-reports and expression of how they felt. Despite being free, in theory, to interact in any way they wish, the interactions were typically hostile, insulting, and dehumanizing. Prisoners immediately became very passive, while guards were very active in the giving orders. The most common form of verbal behavior and verbal exchange was strikingly impersonal. With few references to individual identity, it also was clear to all participants that no physical violence will be tolerated in various kinds. But more indirect aggressions, such as verbal insults, were quite common, especially in the part of the guards. Results for prisoners. Even when they thought they were not being observed, the prisoners' private conversations were 90% concerned with the immediate conditions of, in the prison, such as food, privileges, punishment, and guard harassment, and so on. Only 10% of the time did they talk about their lives outside of the prison. The most dramatic evidence of the impact of the situation on, on the participants was the scene in the reaction of five prisoners who had to be released because of extreme depression, crying, rage, and acute anxiety. This began as early as the second day. The fifth prisoner was released after being treated for a psychomatic rash, which covered various parts of his body. Of the remaining prisoners, only two said they were not willing to forfeit the money they had earned in return for being paroled. The experiment due to the was due to last for two weeks, was terminated after six days. All remaining prisons were delighted by their unexpected good fortune. In contrast, most of the guards seemed to be distressed by the decision. They had apparently become successfully involved in their roles, that they were enjoying the extreme power and control. They exercised over the prisoners and were reluctant to give it up. 
Although one guard reporting being upset at a prisoner suffering, they all arrived to work on time, often stayed on duty voluntary without additional pay. Like prisoners, they rarely exchanged personal information. They either talked about problem prisoners or other prison topics or did not talk at all. Post-experimental data revealed that when individual guards were alone with a single prisoner out of range of any recording equipment, such as on the way to the toilet, harassment was even greater than it was in the yard. There was a daily escalation of guard aggression, even after most prisoners had stopped resisting slash rebelling. And despite of the prisoners' distress, which became obvious as early as the second day, after the first day, almost all the prisoners' rights, including time and conditions of sleep and eating, came to be refined as by the guards as privileges, which had seemed to be earned by obedient behavior, watching movies and reading constructive activities that had always been planned and suggested by the experimenters were arbitrarily canceled until further notice and subsequently never allowed. In this study, Zimbardo found that his hypothesis was true.